We previously stated that we could find the area underneath a curve using what's called an integral. And this made a lot of sense when we thought about an integral in context of what we were actually finding. So, for example, suppose I were given a function v of t, and let's just for the sake of this problem make v of t really easy, something like where v of t is just some constant. So let's just say v of t here, we are measuring this in feet per second, right? So we'll just say that this is in feet per second. And I wanted to see over a certain amount of time, let's say we'll say A is here and B is here, over a certain amount of time, I wanted to know how much distance was traveled. Well, if this function is giving me my rate, it's giving me how many feet I'm traveling per second. And this here from A to B, this area here would have to be the amount of distance that is traveled. And we would say this in calculus terms, we would say that s of t is the integral of v of t with respect to t from a to b. And this makes sense that s of t, what we've previously known as a position or distance function, is the integral or the antiderivative of our velocity function. So if we integrate our velocity function from, with, from a to b, it, we will be given our distance, which would then represent also the area underneath this curve. Now, if r of t were given in, let's say, feet, instead of feet per second, but, you know, we'll go feet per hour. We'll pretend that we're moving pretty slowly. So we'll say feet per hour here. And we know that t is measured in hours. What would the unit be for the amount that we've accumulated under this rate curve? Well, here we could think about, again, the height of our function at any one of these points, we'll say that this here, is given to us in feet per hour. And the distance that we've traveled here has got to be the time passed in hours. This is the time in hours. And so, again, when we find the area, we're really just multiplying the length times the width. So we're multiplying feet per hours times hours. So it makes sense that what we're given here is how much distance we've traveled in feet. So it's this idea and this logic here again that the area underneath the curve represents the distance traveled if we're given some kind of rate. And if we're given some other type of rate, we're just understanding that whatever it, whatever is in our numerator, whatever that we're measuring with respect to some other parameter, that is what we are finding when we find the area underneath the curve. And we use the definite integral to help us find that. That was kind of the big emphasis from the fundamental theorem of calculus. So with that said, I wanted to just really go through some practice problems here, uh, give you some time to work through these on your own, um, but just have an opportunity to discuss and make sense of some of these rate graphs. So let's try this first one here. It says that the graph given to the right models the rate of rainfall in inches per hour from midnight until 6 a.m. during the storm. So the x-axis here, we'll, here we're using t as our unit, which represents time. So this here would represent midnight when t is equal to 0. And when t is equal to 6, that would refer then to 6 a.m. On the flip side here, our y-axis, this is measuring the rate of rainfall. Okay, so remember, this is the rate of rainfall in inches per hour. So the rate of rainfall in inches per hour. Okay, so remember, this function is giving us a rate. It is not the amount of rainfall necessarily, but the rate at which the rain is falling. So write a sentence to explain what point A on the graph represents. So given what we've just discussed, think about this for a second. What are we saying here? We are saying that at 3 a.m., so point A would have to be 3 a.m. At 3 a.m., it is raining at a rate of what? One inch, one inch per hour, okay? That is, not how, that is not the amount of rain that we have at 3 a.m. It is the rate at which the rain is falling. 
So we say the rain is falling, or the, it is raining at a rate of one inch per hour. Next question, what is the slope of the graph between points A and B? So let me kind of highlight that here. Between A and B, what is the slope of the graph? Well, we can, you know we can find the slope. Um, so this would be the value, so R of B minus R of A minus, or all over, I should say, 4 minus 3. And what is R of B? It's 1. What is R of A? 1. So all of that over 4 minus 3, then we just get 0. Now, let's think about that value in the context of the problem. We would then say between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m., there is no change in the rate of rainfall. We would say that the rate of rainfall is constant. It is constant here. Okay? All right, next question. Let's just change colors. What is the slope of the graph between points B and C, which is representing this part right here? So what is that slope? So kind of the same process that we did before. Let's look at our vertical change in that case. Our vertical change, we went from 1 to 0. So we can say from 0 minus 1 if we wanted to. So because at point when t is equal to 5, we have 0. When t is equal to 4, we have 1. So 0 minus 1 over 5 minus 4. And that would be negative 1. So again, the slope here between b and c is negative 1. So let's think about what does that represent. We would then say between 4 a.m. and 5 a.m., the rate of rainfall decreases at a rate, at a rate, let's rewrite that, at a rate of one inch per hour squared, okay? Now, let's be very clear here. R of t is already a rate function. So if we are describing the rate of change of a rate function, we're technically looking at what we typically think of as the second derivative. It's the rate at which the rate of change is changing. So that is why we're describing that in one inch per inch hours squared. Okay, so next, let's actually find the definite integral or the integral of our function here from 3 to 5. So that would represent this shaded region that I have shaded. I'll just kind of highlight this again in green here. So let's find that. And we are going to do this without actually integrating since we don't actually know the function. We don't actually know what r of t is here, so we can't really find the antiderivative. So we're just going to find the area of this trapezoid here. Well, let's make sure we understand our parameter. So we've got for this trapezoid, which I've drawn kind of poorly here, um, what would be our height there? Our height looks like it is 1. Um, this distance here would be has a distance of 1. This base here has a distance of 2. Okay, and that's all we're going to need. I'm going to bring that down here. Okay. So there's a couple ways that we can do this. We can find the average of our heights here. So we can say 1 plus 2 all over 2 times our height times 1, which would just be 3 halves. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to split this up as an area and a triangle and add those up, you could do that as well. But I'm just finding the area here using my trapezoid area formula. The average of our heights times the base. So we have three halves here. Now, let's make sure we understand what that means. We would say between, going back to our graph, just make sure that we understand what we found here. Going back to our graph, we would say between 3 a.m., and 5 a.m., so let's write that, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., the total rainfall 
was approximately 3 half inches. So by integrating or finding the area of the rate graph underneath the rate graph and the x-axis, we are then able to find the approximate amount of rainfall that we actual ha actually had. So the amount of actual rain, not the rate of the rainfall. And final question, approximate how much total rain then fell from midnight until 6 a.m. So if we go back to our graph, we already found how much rain fell from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. Because of the fact here that this appears to be pretty flat between 5 and 6, right here on the x-axis that appears to indicate to us there wasn't really any rain. We just need to approximate now how much rain fell from midnight to 3 a.m. And there's a couple ways that you could go about doing this. Obviously, you could try to do a couple trapezoids. But I find here that actually drawing a triangle there actually gives us a pretty good approximation for that area underneath the curve. And if we look at that carefully here, I just kind of list out our uh, measurements, we would see that our height is going to be one, our base is equal to three. So we would then say our area of this triangle is one half the base times the height, which would then give us three over two. So that's the area of this region in red. If we combine that with what we found in the first part, we can say three halves, plus the area between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., which we saw was also 3 halves. So then we have a total of approximately, actually let me use the approximate symbol, approximately 3 inches of rain. Okay, so let me kind of bring that all back together so we can kind of take a look at that graph and make sure that we understand exactly what we found there. Okay, all right. Let's try to do another rate problem. Let's look at the back part of our notes and let's go ahead and look at this problem. We have a high school cro cross country runner uh, and this runner is on a 20 minute practice run. And this table gives us the runner's velocity. So let's take a quick look at the velocity now. So we are given certain time intervals. So at four, for example, this is at the four minute mark. We know that the runner's velocity at the four minute mark was 8.8 .8 miles per hour. And we can see how that velocity changes over um, four minute intervals. So it goes zero to 20, so we got various four minute intervals. So the first thing I probably notice here is that we are given the time in minutes, however, our velocity is actually given to us in miles per hour. So you really have a choice. You can actually do this in terms of miles per minute or you could also change this into uh, the, these time intervals in terms of hours. It's up to you. So again, you can, re, you can rewrite your velocity. You could also rewrite your time. So if I wanted to, and I wanted to plot these values here, so let's just quickly do that. And I'm, a, I'm a visual learner, so often I'll, I'll, you'll hear me say uh, that it's helpful for me to actually plot these points so I can kind of see how these values look. So we've got four, we've got eight, We've got 12, 16, and 20. These are the time intervals, so I'll put this time here. And then we have V of T here. And we can see that goes from 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. This is our velocity in miles per hour. And if I were to plot, that, plot those points, I would get something that looks something along the lines of this. We have 8.8. .8, we have 8 gives us 9.5. I should probably lower that a little bit here. 8.8 is probably around there. That's 9.5 right around there. 12 would give us 9.7, which is a little higher than that. 16 gives us 9.3, which means we drop down a bit. And then finally, 20 gives us, looks like that runner's maximum velocity at 10. So I'm going to go ahead and just connect those points so we can kind of get a sense of what we will be finding in a bit. Okay, so that, that function there tracks the runner's velocity over the course of 20 minutes. So if we wanted to find the, if we wanted to approximate the total distance of the practice run, we can do that using our favorite approximation method. And I'm gonna leave it fairly open-ended for you. Uh, it's up to you what you wanna do uh, to find this area underneath the curve. 
Um, if you want to use Riemann sums, you can. Um, I'm going to go ahead and actually use the trapezoid method. I think a lot of those actually work given the fact that we don't really have constant changes. Um, I'm going to, I, I want to go with the trapezoid method. I'm going to just kind of go ahead and do that. Uh, for all of these, then the, we're going to say the following. The area would have to be one half, which is going to allow me to find the average of all my heights with um, the height here or the base, each one of these bases here. And I'm going to go actually with changing my time to hours. Since I've already plotted my y values, I think it'll just be easier to go ahead and rewrite my time in hours. So this would, four minutes would have to be 1 over 15. That, that is to say 4 minutes is 1 15th of an hour. 8 minutes would be 2 over 15. 12 minutes would be 1 5th of an hour. 16 would be 4 15ths of an hour. And 20 would be 1 3rd of an hour. So again, this is the time in hours. Okay? So we're going to say here that our... Trapezoid, so we're going to go ahead and write the width of each of our sub of our trapezoids is going to be 115. You can call it the width, you can call it the base, it's up to you. And then I'm just going to go ahead and jot all of my heights. So I've got 8.8 .8 plus, and I'm going to have to now add up, that's going to give us, that gave me this trapezoid here, which is actually a triangle. Now the next one here, I'm going to need to add up H1 and H2 which means I need to take 8.8 .8 and add to it 9.5. So, so that divided by 2 is going to give me the average of those heights for that trapezoid. So you can see here that would be 8.8 .8 plus 9.5 plus 9.5 plus 9.7, which would give us this next trapezoid, plus 9.3 plus 10. Add all those up, and for the sake of time, our approximate area comes out to 2.82. What does that represent? That represents the total distance in miles that this runner ran over the course of that 20-minute run. And you cross-country runners can tell me whether or not that's a good pace. Uh, that sounds like a lot to me, but I'm slow. All right, next one. Let's find the average, approximate average speed of the runner of the practice course. Um, to find the average speed, we're needing to find the average value of the function over this interval, which is going to be 1 over the width of this entire interval here. So from here to here, I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to highlight this in a different color. So this entire width, that's 20 minutes. And again, we're writing this in terms of the time in hours. So we're going to write this as 1 third. Okay, so that's 20 minutes is equal to one third of an hour. And then we are going to multiply that times the integral that we found or the area underneath the curve that we found in the previous part. So that would come out to 8.46 miles per hour. Okay, so that was the runner's average speed. And we use the average value of the function formula there, which is effectively finding the area under the curve, a.k.a. the integral, and dividing it by the width of our interval. All right, so next part. Let's find the runner's acceleration from time t is equal to 10 to t is equal to 14, which let me try to mark in a different color here. From 10 to 14 here, and this actually 10 should probably be right, right there. What we're finding is that acceleration. So that acceleration is just going to be slope. So we can say um, at 10, like maybe I can mark it here, at 10, that approximate velocity would have to be about 9.6, which is just the average of those two values. Okay? And then at 14, that velocity would have to be approximately 9.5. So we're just going to do the slope formula. The change in y, so we're going to go from 9.6 um, to, or actually maybe we should probably go the other way around, okay? Um, 9.6, so 14, oh, sorry, let me go ahead and rewrite that. So that would be 
9.5 minus 9.6 all over 14 minus 10. Okay? And that would be negative 0 0.1 over 4. And again, this was in minutes. So I'm going to have to rewrite this in hours, in miles per hour, because our velocity we're used to working with in miles per hour. So that's approximately negative 1.5 miles per hour squared. So that acceleration is actually decreasing there from 10 to 14. Okay? All right. What is the minimum number of times that this runner had a velocity of exactly 9 miles per hour? So we would say that the runner had a velocity of 9 miles per hour at least, think about this before we write it, once. And when would that occur? Occurring between the 4 and 8 minute mark. Because, and before I write the reason why, think about this for a second. Does this concept and this type of question seem familiar to you? And the answer is yes. We're thinking about a mean value theorem type of situation here. So, um, well, I should say actually mean value theorem will probably make a little bit more sense in the context of the next problem here, since that's actually referring to the rate at that which this is changing. But we can say that if that runner, if that velocity of nine miles per hour has to be hit once between the four and eight minute mark, because there is no way that you could get from 8.8 .8 to 9.5 without at some point, at some instance, writing, running nine miles per hour. Okay, so we would say because v of t is a continuous function. So it's the same logic as mvt, but although it isn't really quite mvt because we're not actually comparing the average rate of change to an instantaneous rate of change. So I misspoke initially, but the logic behind it remains the same. There's no way that you could go from 8.8 .8 miles per hour to 9.5 miles per hour without, without at some point for one specific instant, at least one instance, running 9 miles per hour. Okay, and then finally, now we're getting to the MVT type of question. Can you guarantee that at some point during the run that the runner's acceleration was 0.5 miles per hour per minute? Well, yeah, well, let's look at the average acceleration here. Well, the average acceleration for this entire run, we saw that the velocity changed from 10, from zero to 10, I should say. We started out at zero miles per hour and then made it all the way to 10 miles per hour there. And then 20 minus zero, that was the length of the entire interval. So it was one half. So yes, MVT states that the acceleration at some point in the interval must be equal to the average acceleration. So since the average acceleration was one half, right? Remember what MVT says. MVT says that if the function is continuous, which this runner's uh, velocity over this time had to be continuous, assuming that this runner didn't stop at some point, um, MVT, the mean value theorem, st states that the average, there has to be at least one instance where the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. So there's got to be some point somewhere along this run where this runner had to have had an acceleration of half a mile per minute or half a mile, half a mile per hour per minute. Okay. And I'll save the next problem for the next video since it is a calculator heavy problem.